What is MAD data analysis? Well, MAD is an acronym, and you know, memorable acronyms are important. But the, the idea behind it is to foster an environment where you're doing deep analytics on data, and you're doing it in an agile way that lets the analysts be in control of the process, but you're also not losing the organization and the long-term view of how to keep the data in a way that you can go back and find things and look for cross-currents in your analysis. So the acronym itself stands, the M stands for magnetic, with the idea that there should be a, a place that's attractive for people to park their data, park their analysis, park their scripts, uh, as a sort of central watering hole. The A is for agile, which is to allow the analysts to do their jobs and get out of their way. And the D is for deep, for deep statistical methods. Okay. So how does MAD differ from traditional data warehousing and business intelligence? Good. Well, you know, traditionally there was a very strong focus in data warehousing, and you can read this in the big books on warehousing by Inman, where they'll say the only data that should enter the warehouse is data that's already been cleaned and integrated mm -hmm. with the schema. And the idea with the MAD approach is that that's completely wrong. That pushes data away. That's the opposite of magnetic. It's repellent. Uh, the whole goal is data, bring it on in. We'll clean it up later. We'll put it together later. Let's get some data products in there and get the analysts to do their job. Interesting. So I know a lot of your open source projects deal with uh, the university side and the industry side. How do you see those two working together? So this is a really interesting thing. As I was coming up as a student, uh, really interesting open source was coming out of universities. And I'm thinking of things like the Ingress and Postgres database projects at Berkeley, the mock operating system at uh, Carnegie Mellon. These are things that today are parts of commercial products. They, along the way, were open source. And they began as research, blue sky research. And what's changed now is there's, I would say, more professionally done open source now. When you look at open source today, when it comes out at first, it's much more professional software, but it's further uh, uh, disconnected from research. And so what's happening is a lot of the open source that's very important is really me too software. So Linux was a clone of Unix, and Hadoop is a clone of Google's MapReduce. And there's a bit of a disconnect between the innovation side, at the, which you know, the universities are good at, and the professionalism of open source that we expect today, which uh, you know, companies are good at. And so the question is, can we put those back together through some sort of industrial academic partnerships? Uh, and I'm hopeful that that can be done, but we need to change our, our way of business a little bit. What do you think those partnerships would look like? Well, so I have an example with the Mad Lib work we're doing between Berkeley and the sponsor right now is EMC uh, Greenplum. And the goal there is they, they would have been happy to donate money to my research funds, but I said, you know what I really need is I need uh, engineering time. And the thing I cannot do on campus is run a professional engineering shop. There's no career incentives for people to be mm -hmm. programmers at the university. There's no QA department at the university to test the code. You guys have all these processes, you have expertise, and you can hire really good people who have a career path in the company. Can we find an arrangement where those people are working on open source code in collaboration with the people at the university? And so it's a different way of doing research funding where the contributions are not financial from the company, the contributions are actually engineering sweat. And uh, I'm real excited about it. It's an interesting experiment. It's yeah. going well so far. That's great. So last question I have for you. In a 2008 blog post, you, read, you wrote, we're at the beginning of the industrial revolution of data. Yeah. Are we still at the beginning? Have we moved past the, the beginning at all? That's interesting. Um, the, you know, this industrial revolution analogy is useful. You don't want to stretch it too far. But um, production of data, automated production of data, has blossomed over two years enormously, mm -hmm. uh, and particularly in the sort of... Uh, monitoring what's going on in the use of inf computer infrastructure. Less so on the sensor side, actually, on the physical side. That's still very much at the beginning. That'll mm -hmm. expand. Um, what we're still missing is the part of the Industrial Revolution that was so important, which was not on the production side, but on the transport side. So the railways, so to speak, the mm -hmm. shipping lanes, that was all part of what made the Industrial Revolution possible. We still have a very hard time sharing data for all kinds of reasons, technical reasons, uh, political and uh, uh, organizational reasons. And that's not happening quickly because that stuff's really hard. Uh, so that's going to be some friction for a while. Right. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Appreciate it.